Hello everyone, thank you for inviting me to today's discussion. Yes, and I'm awaiting all the great speakers to connect. And uh, shortly to present myself, uh, I'm a member of Serbo Roma community from Ukraine, a board member of Arca Youth Organization in Ukraine, and uh, at the current event, I am as a representative of the area team, and I have a huge honor to be today a moderator of this discussion on the history of Roma movement with our well-respected speakers, Broughton Foxen and Thomas Exxon. Thank you for joining us, and uh, let's start. At this time, 50 years ago, an international group of Roma activists and their non-Roma allies gathered in London to discuss the situation of Roma people and build a common agenda within the Roma on the path towards emancipation and self-determination. This historical meeting is a milestone that marks the beginning of the contemporary Roma political and cultural movement. And today we have a unique opportunity to speak with two organizers of the first World Roma Congress, 50 years after the historic event. Let me shortly introduce to you our honored speakers for today's discussion. Graton Paxson, a writer and activist, was in large part responsible for organizing first World Roma Congress and was elected its general secretary. He was a founding member of at increasing the rights of the Gypsy Roma travel community. Nowadays, he is a chair of the democratic transition working to introduce a new electronic voting system to increase the legitimacy and political clout of the International Romani Union and the broader pro-Roma movement. In addition to his activist and campaign work, Mr. Foxon has also written several books related to the history and experiences of Gypsy Roma traveler community. And our speaker is Thomas Ekton, who ran first Gypsy Council Caravan Summer School in 1967. He worked at the University of Greenwich and currently he is Emeritus Professor of Romani Studies there as well visiting professor of Corvinus University in Budapest and visiting professor at Buckinghamshire New University. He is a patron of the Roma Support Group in London, a member of the Committee of the Gypsy Council, the Advisory Council for the Education of Romanis and Travelers, and the Church's Network of Gypsies, Travelers and Roma, as well board member of Gypsy Law Society. Mr. Acton is also secretary of the local Brinkwood Gypsy Support Group. He has written many books and articles on Roma Gypsies and Travelers. So, and now I would like to open the floor for our today's discussion. And in order to do that, I have prepared several questions for our honored guests. As well, by the end, we will have some times where the audience will have a unique opportunity to engage in the discussion and ask these questions in the chat box. Please prepare your questions. Before starting, I would like to ask you, Mr. Paxson and Mr. Acton, to keep the answers as brief as possible due to limited time, unfortunately, and the willingness to receive as much as possible feedback from you. Thank you so much, and we can begin. The first question is, um, what was the atmosphere and initial feeling at the time of late 60s? What developments led to convening of the first World Roma Congress? Who were the driving forces behind the organization of the Congress? And what role did you play personally in the Congress? Please, who wants to start first? Feel free, you have to 
push the button blue and after you can open your mic. Perhaps I'll jump in. Is that okay? Oh, you're jumping in ahead of me. Ah, Thomas Actor jumping over me. I don't think I want to allow that. I don't think I want to allow that. I have seniority here by about 10 years and I shall speak first. Please. Uh, you see me with a tie. I come here respectfully, but I am a person with little respect. And that's it's kind of been my role to be a troublemaker. So stand by. There may be trouble. Um, yes, the, the Congress was a great thing, um, but leading up to it was a very uh, troubled life for myself because I had deserted from the British Army, gone over to Ireland, and with travellers in Ireland, had a lot of trouble with the police there. And when I came back to England, I had a lot more trouble. And trouble is kind of the name of the game for me. You've frozen. Sorry, we've got some technical issues. Hopefully, Mr. Buxton will join us soon. And okay, well, Jubilee Congress, which is the kind of open forum for everybody, unlike any other Congress, will lead to some kind of formation of of I, I would like to call it ahead of ahead of any real decisions uh, a congress forum we had a forum we had a forum we had the european roma and traveler forum it was snatched from us and in its place we got ariac we got a cultural setup i'm, I'm sorry but i'm unha very unhappy about that the two should be there but at the moment there's only the one there long live culture but we need politics we need a pretty tough bit of politics to go on here. So the, 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 world, the World Romany Congress opened the door to a, co a, to a political process and took it so far, but it's got an awful long way to go yet. That's my opening statement. Thank you a lot, Mr. Buxton. Mr. Acton, please feel free. Okay, well, um, I agree with everything Gretchen's just said, but if you're looking to go back to a time before most of the audience for this session was born, um, but at a time when I was at the age of many of the young listeners, uh, I was just 18 years old when I read about the foundation. Somebody just put up a notice saying no voice. Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Uh, not my problem then. Okay, I, I, I was a student of 18 and I read about the foundation of the Gypsy Council in December 1966 in newspapers and I almost immediately uh, looked for, I think, a phone call for Grattan, a phone for Grattan and I wrote to Grattan asking him to speak and I, uh, we actually just found the letter he wrote back to me. Um, early in January, and he came to speak very early in January 1967 to the Anti-Racist Student Society at Oxford, and he was incredibly charismatic then. Um, a, a very soft voice, piercing blue eyes. Blue? They're brown, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> My eyes are round. Okay. <laughs> I Old men forget. Anyway, All right. uh, you, you, you had a, a spellbound. When you called for volunteers, a number of people volunteered. But I was lucky that my family home was about 10 miles away only from where the Gypsy Council was planning to run its very first educational project. And as it turned out, I had my 19th birthday in the middle of living, helping to run a caravan school on an illegal encampment on a disused military airfield in Hornchurch in East London. And that was a life-changing experience. And I suppose I've been involved ever since. I went back to Oxford. Uh, Grattan introduced me to other 
activists in Oxford and we fought for a site at the Slade. It was called the Slade in Oxford. And I ended up uh, doing my PhD on gypsies. All the time working as I could in, in local areas. And so by the time we came to 1971, uh, I was used to running projects. I'd uh, run several summer schools in caravans, always in illegal uh, places. I'd, been, I'd acted as Grattan's driver and I'd driven him all over the country going to evictions. And I was his kind of dog's body for some of the admin, not for the admin in the Congress itself, but some of the admin around it. And also I was responsible for keeping the academics at bay. Uh, there were a lot of well-meaning Jay, like myself, who wanted to take part. And he made me the kind of guard dog to keep the other academic gage occupied. And we, we ran a conference at Oxford just before the World Romney Congress. And at that conference, only three Romney people attended. Ian Hancock, Venya de Gila, better known as Jan Kokonovsky, or he was then, and Matteo Maximov. Um, Matteo Maximov and Ian Hancock, of course, came on to the Congress. Um, um, Vanya de Gila uh, wasn't very well. And that was how I got involved in the Congress. I was running around using my little car to go and fetch delegates from the station, um, running messages, doing whatever was asked of me. And I ended up as the noting secretary of the Education Commission as well. Perhaps that's enough for the moment. Thank you a lot, Mr. Acton, for this great introduction and the initial feeling before uh, the Romani Congress, First Roman Congress, and uh, preparation, how it was going. And now uh, I would like to ask a second question. As it known, during the time uh, of the First Roma Congress was carried the Gypsy Festival, where Jarko Jovanovic and Raya Bilenberg had a chance to perform. Please tell us more about the festival. What was the program of it? Who were performance and what was the connection to the Congress? Okay, well, I don't remember a heck of a lot about the festival and I think I should put in a note or two about what led up to the Congress. I'm sorry to go back to the first question, but I'm not sorry at all. Um, because the person we need to credit a lot for is a man called Vida Voivod. Uh, he started the first international committee in Paris and came to me in Ireland uh, quite out of the blue, really, in 1964. And as we sat around the campfire, he was telling me about the ambition to have a Congress, to have a World Romany Congress. And it, it transpired that it would was to be held in the Paris, Paris de l'UNESCO in, in, in Paris, of course. Um, it couldn't take place, couldn't get such a grand venue. And the Gypsy Council got ra rather impatient about this. So we said, OK, look, we will host it in London. So that was really the bit that led up to it. Uh, nobody supported the Congress. Everybody came of their own, on their own way, except, of course, the Yugoslavs and some of the other East European people who got their transport paid. Uh, that's what came. That's what brought the Congress together. Now, the festival came afterwards on Hampstead Heath. A uh, bunch of academic, uh, bunch, yeah, they were academic in a sense. They were ar architectural students who built a wonderful blow-up kind of arena for, for that thing. And uh, there was a beautiful half-size caravan up on the stage. And, and Raya, in a wonderful costume, put herself on, on the front page of the Times of London. And that was, that was the festival, with Jaco there. Of course, Jaco, Jaco played a big part too, because he was the person who wrote the fresh lyrics, the Jalem Jalem lyrics that we have today. So I add that in as a note and a little bit about the festival. 
Thank you, Mr. Paxan. Mr. Ekton, if you also would like to add something for the question about the festival, and we will go on with the national anthem and other singles in the next session. Yeah, okay. Um, I think, perhaps echoing your last system, I'd like to emphasize the role of art here. Um, the way I now understand Voivod, Vida Voivod is that he was a really great provocative performance artist. Um, he had nerves of steel and a poker face, and he simply faced down the gage, basically with jokes that only Roma would understand. And the gage was so indignant, saying, this is a fake king. But of course, everybody knew that. But we enjoyed, or the people at the time enjoyed the fact that Gage were either really deferential to somebody they saw as a real king, or incredibly outraged uh, by his impudence. And either, either reaction amused the Roma. And the upshot of it was that the demand for reparations was taken seriously for the first time. Vida Voivod found a way of making a demand which seemed ludicrous and impossible only right. And he did it through his performance art. And then Grattan Puxen with Donald Kenrick and others took it forward and provided the documentation to the point where we now have nobody seriously questions the existence of the Roma Holocaust. That's one thing. The other important artist, yes, Jarko Jovanovic. And I'd like to, I mean, just coming back to the personal, if we look at the way in which Jarkovic's family, his children, and uh, Raya's children are intermarried, uh, they've become a single kind of artistic dynasty, which continues to this day. And Jaco actually brought Grattan to where Raya was performing in Paris. And um, Raya's husband, Tora, remembers this very well. And Tora certainly is convinced that bringing what perhaps was the most privileged, uh, the most prestigious Roma artist of the day, Raya defecting from Russia, was a little bit uh, like that uh, ballet dancer, the, the one who danced with R Rudolf Nureyev. It was at that level of a cultural event. And Raya, when she got to the West, was absolutely outraged how disrespectfully Roma were treated compared with the Soviet Union, which may have had faults, but at least it treated in principle, people of all ethnicities as equal. So that cultural weight and the fact that Yarko uh, turned up with Raya uh, at the beginning of the Congress um, and Yarko was one of Grattan's strongest supporters in France I think that was one of the things that was crucial in reaching the decision that what was originally planned just as a preparatory meeting for a Congress was actually a Congress. Um, so I think that Jaco, supported by Raya, the politics of their art were not not hidden, they were very overt. And uh, that was important in giving the Congress the force that it had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Roxon. And going back uh, to the question uh, of national anthem, flag and universal terminology, what was chosen during the first World Roma Congress, can you tell more about it? Who were the initiators? 
were there other proposals and why initially 8th of April was chosen as a uh, international Roma day, at that time national Roma day? Yeah, there was quite a lot of discussion around the flag because of course we'd come there with, as you see from the rare photographs from the first Congress, we had simply a blue, the sky, and green for the land, as I understand its meaning, with no red wheel. And we did sit around and some people said, let's have a fire in it, let's have a red star there. And it was largely the influence of W.R. Rishi, who was an attache from the, um, what you'd call the embassy, the, the, the representative government in London, of the Indian government. He came as an attache for, just on his own private capacity. And he said, look, with that, with that heritage of India, with that origin of India, why not have the flag symbolize that by having what he called the Ashok Chakra on the center of the flag? And it sounded great. And it was perfectly and simple. 8th of April was simply the day that the Congress opened and was proclaimed to be and should ever. I'm so sorry, we have some technical difficulties. We cannot hear you, Mr. Fox, unfortunately, now. But he doesn't know. He might come. I'll carry. Well, <laughs> another my hopes from the Jubilee Congress of so many of us coming together that perhaps we'll have enough people arguing to bring back 8th of April as Roma Nation Day. And I'm I, so sorry, Mr. Paxson. We just didn't hear you for a while. Can uh, you please repeat why was chosen the 8th of April, not 7th, okay. not 9th, but actually the 8th. Okay. The 8th of April was very simply the day of the opening of the First World Romani Congress and was declared that we should commemorate and celebrate the 8th of April as Roma Nation Day. Today you hear quite often other versions of this, of International Roma Day, and I feel this is wrong, and I'm annoyed by it, because it is not about an international, it is about a Roma nation, a merging nation, and we're not a minority either. I often hear this word minority, how can even 12 million people in Europe and perhaps 14, 20, 20 million, some people say. A nation is not a minority of that size. I think the Roma nation is considerably larger than number, a number of the other uh, member states of the, of the European Union. So we're not a minority and it's not International Roma Day. It's Roma Nation Day and we are a nation. Thank you, Ross. My political. But, but it's great to hear from first source. Yeah, this this real um, essential information for us as Roma youth, how you were interpreting it from the beginning. And Thomas Acton, do you have something to add uh, about the creation of uh, national symbols of Roma during the first Roma Congress? Were there are some other propositions that uh, could be implemented but didn't? Thank you. Um, you're, you're, call, you're calling on me. Um, yeah. Um, first, going back to the, the song, Jelen Jelen. Um, this was a traditional melody um, going back I don't know how long. And Yako Jovanovic actually first recorded a version on it on uh, Yugoslav radio in, I think, as early as 1948. Originally, yes. Yeah. And then the third verse, which refers specifically to the experiences of Roma in co uh, concentration camps and at the hands of extermination squads, Ekali Legia, um, that emerged, we don't know quite when, after the war. Again, uh, Iaco, uh, he, he um, orchestrated it and so forth and that was in part of Alexander Petrovich's film which is in English is called I Met Happy Gypsies and I think in Serbian is called Goose Feathers um, and that made it very popular uh, 
when we went up to Birmingham on the Saturday of the Congress, I think that was the third, second, third, I can't remember the, it was the second or third, but on the Saturday uh, afternoon, we took a coach up to a place called Slacky Lane in Warsaw, where three traveller children had been burned to death in a caravan um, during a police eviction. And uh, we went up there to make representations about this. And uh, Colonel Thomas Holomeg, the Czech Rom military prosecutor who was there, led the delegation to Warsaw Police Station um, very robustly. And we felt that that was a tremendous triumph. The police didn't know where to put themselves when they were excoriated um, by a foreign policeman or foreign military police prosecutor of this standing. And then we went back and we were entertained. I remember very well by the travellers. You can't visit travellers uh, in their caravans, even the, those who are in terrible situations without being well fed and watered. And then as it grew to dusk, we got back on the bus, which came to collect us from Slacky Lane. And we were about a couple of hours going down the motorway uh, back to London. And I must say, we were all in a very good mood. Uh, and Yako got his balalaika out and first he was just playing and then he said let's make another verse for the Congress and he kept strumming and the people were crowding him leaning o over the uh, backs of the chairs and every time he got another verse he would call people and we'd crawl, crawl we'd clamber down the aisle to listen to him to a new version of the verse and then it came out and so we, we actually were there I was there and her, saw the actual process of producing this version and then the next day which was the Sunday on the Sunday afternoon uh, it was received with great acclaim um, and there was the debate over the flag and I remember the debate over the flag very well because Actually, I was taking notes, and it was the only debate in which every one of the delegates spoke. It was one of the longest debates. Um, but in the end, the, what the organisers wanted uh, triumphed, and the flag, as we can see it behind Grattan's he head there today, uh, with some writing on it, uh, was adopted. So uh, that was how the, the anthem got adopted. And... and for a time, we used it everywhere. We, in our school projects, we taught it in Romney to the children. I've, I've got little cassette recordings of people singing it by the side of the, the road. Um, the, uh, if you see the film tomorrow, you'll see about the eviction at Turkey Street at Enfield and how um, Bernadette Devlin helped us defeat it. Well, the attempts to evict them went on and on for a couple of years. And I've got uh, somewhere cassette recordings of uh, gypsy children singing Jalem Jalem to the police and bulldozers approaching them to try and get them off Turkey Street. It became an absolute icon for us. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you a lot for your responses. And... Uh... Yes, it's really very interesting discussion and we could uh, come back in the end, but uh, for now I have a next question, uh, which is really very important for female part uh, of our world. And uh, as it now, the first World Roma Congress is uh, typically seen as an event that was led, led and attended by men. However, we know that there were several Roma travelers women who participated in the Congress, as Melania Spita, a Sinti woman from Frankfurt whose family members died in Auschwitz, whose main role was to link Sinti and French Romani people during the first Roma Congress, and Raya Billenberg, actress uh, from the Roma Theatre in Moscow, about whom we already were talking. Can you please tell more? What was their role during the first World Roma Congress? And what about other female representatives? 
where was the, was the topic of Roma women's rights discussed or mentioned during the first Congress? I have to admit that the Congress, with great apologies to womanhood, didn't have any special session about, about you know, women's rights or uh, liberation of, of women. But Melanie Spitter was quite, quite, a, quite a, very different. <laughs> you couldn't get more two different people from Raya and, and, uh, and um, Melanie. Melanie was quite a quiet person, uh, but a very firm person and had a lot, quite a lot to say when she did open her mouth. And of course, Raya was very loud, very um, outgoing. In fact, I remember at the beginning of the Congress, we were all gathering around as she came in the door because it was so exciting to see somebody in that costume and in, with that attitude and, and with her wanting to, you know, be there and say something. Whereas Melanie perhaps was more a retiring person. Uh, but it's wonderful to hear what she managed to do in the years following the Congress. And I've had to catch up with that lately. Her documentary work, her film work, is now going to stand as a terrific con contribution to, to the whole genocide history and helping us make a case. So thanks a lot to Spit, uh, to Melanie. I'm, I'm lucky, poor Vlake. I, she's no longer with her. Raya. Um, is a, a little bit older than me, but is still around, I'm glad to say. And I, I believe even uh, Natasha, her daughter, may um, come in on the, on the Jubilee Congress, be part of it. So what can I say? There were only two women there as delegates. But at the end, uh, in the last final session, a lot of people came in from the roadside because I don't know if people know, but uh, the Congress had to be kept secret because of the huge anti gypsy feeling going on in the village of uh, Shelfield. Uh, and they had even got a fund up of 4,000 pounds to, to get rid of us. And the caravans were lying down the road quite close by. And as, as I say, on the last day, a lot of people did come in carrying their children, children, adults and women. So there was quite, quite a, quite a uh, representative uh, thing of women at the last session. And I should say amongst the Roma people in England, women have a big role because women always held, held the purse. And it might be the men who sold the horses or sold the wagon or sold this and that and the other, did the kind of general dealing. But it was the women who went out and got made the living and held the money and had a big say in the family. Quite, I would say, equality, a lot of equality. But I'm, I'm sorry to say there was not a deal of equality going on in the Congress but you have caught up a lot since. You, Ali, and the rest, the rest of you, you've been catching up, and it, they needed catching up. Thank you. Mr. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think we can even be more specific and look at the way, because there were other women there who were influential. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just go through them. Maisa Ruda, the then wife of Vanko Ruda, yeah. Um, didn't, I don't think she spoke in an actual session because she wasn't listed as a delegate, but in the meetings of the Education uh, Commission, of which I was the secretary, mm -hmm. she did take an active part. Um, there was a debate going on there with all the, well, a number of the East Europeans saying education was very important to stop people living in caravans or being nomadic. Mm -hmm. And she came vigorously to the support of saying, no, in fact, um, as people had done in the Soviet Union for the first 30 to 40 years of its um, uh, existence, and as people still did in much of Western Europe, there was a human right to travel. And that didn't cut away people's right to education. Nobody had the right to say to people, you must live in houses, you mustn't live in caravans, and if you live in caravans, you can't go to school. And Maisa made that point in the Education Commission. Um, but of course, you're absolutely right. She was seen as just being there as somebody's wife. The same with Margaret Lee, the wife of Tom Lee. Again, she made her opinions clear behind yeah. the scenes, and she went on to be very important in a health campaign, uh, the campaign 
to persuade Romani women to accept tests for cervical cancer. And that was a brilliant campaign because she actually changed English Romani people's ideas of what Mokhati, Mokhati, Marime, um, and of course, Marime doesn't mean putting your own life in danger. And by serious discussion amongst middle-aged people, middle-aged women making middle-aged men understand, she went on, say maybe 10, 15 years later than the Congress, to be absolutely crucial in changing the whole discourse about that and saying this is not this is a matter for medicine. It's not a matter of private shame. You don't have to be ashamed of taking a cervical smear test. Uh, so she was there uh, and she went on to become politically important in her own right. And I'd also mention uh, another student who was there, like me, Ruth Templeton, uh, who was there and helped uh, organize the um, bus up to Warsaw and uh, did errands like me. Uh, and um, she was there. So, mm. yes, there were women there. Uh, did the women challenge the female subordination? No, but they were there. And the passive resistance, in a sense, what we say women hidden from history, they were there and they helped set the stage for the great flowering of Romani feminism in the 1980s. Um, you know, and once women started organizing, we began to wonder, you know, why ever people hadn't considered them capable before. But yes, the, the 1971 Congress was almost just before that, but it included women who were going on to be effective political actors in their own right. And there was a little bit changing around the roles because the person who did all the catering, who gave us all the food and did all the cooking was a man. Mm -hmm. Raywood. And he was there and he, he was disgusted because he couldn't get out of the kitchen to come to the sessions that he wanted to take part in. So a man took a woman, excuse me, a woman's traditional, ancient traditional role. I do the washing up, by the way, at home. I say that straight away to myself and to mention myself, I do the washing up. So there we go. We had a little bit of a yeah, and, and change of roles during the Congress. Well, I'd just say, um, Brian Raywood has written a number of, st an amount of stuff, but what he wrote about English Romany cooking is still worth reading. Um, it's, it's very clear. And it, he relates it to the way of life, to, um, you know, traveling and so forth. Um, yes, 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 it's a very great uh, collection of recipes. I had a chance to see at it. And yes. uh, yeah, I'm really happy to hear that the situation hopefully is changing. And we Roma women, we have a power and we know actually what to do. But what we need, we need support. Yeah. The only that, that's the only limitation of doing this all online. We can't exchange a cup of coffee. We can't eat together, but we can only make the voices heard. Anyway. Yeah, and go into the uh, next question. During the first uh, Roma Congress, uh, what changes were you hoping to achieve? And talking about nowadays, how did the Roma movement and political agenda changed over these fifty years? And what are you expecting for the future? To see. Oh, what so much? So so much is there. So much is there, and so much is about to happen in the next few days. It's quite a. Uh, unfortunately, because I do look at things fairly bluntly, we have gone downhill. As I mentioned in my first words, we lost the forum. We lost the chance to develop. Uh, structurally, it seemed to me to have the right structure to develop democracy through through the forum. I know there were reasons why it failed. I know the personality things. Um, I knew Ruth go back from about 1980. 80, I uh, met him in Frankfurt. Uh, a great guy, a real activist, a man who would go to the frontier, break break frontiers, get through places, and do all kinds of 
things that I very much approved of. So we lost the forum. Can we get something like that back? That's what I hope. I think that there should be perhaps something called a Congress forum, uh, not um, a very formal type centralist thing, a thing where we agree to coordinate and people can come in and go out again, come in when there's a big issue for us, when we need to act together, let us come together. When we have a space of breathing space, by all means, let people be in their own organizations, get on with their own programs, whatever they want to do locally. But sometimes, globally, we need to come together. And that's what I hope this Congress will facilitate. I say we went down downhill, and I don't want to say how, why, who, I don't want to point fingers at anybody, but we all know that our representation at this present time is very low. I wouldn't like to take the temperature. It's, uh, we're, free, uh, we're at freezing point. Our representation is very poor, but technology does give us a chance to build up a real voting system. I think that you mentioned that in the introduction, that there could be a system whereby we have elected representatives instead of people up there in those high positions who are really appointed, appointed from above and not by Rama. So can we surely move forward from that, that um, awkward situation, a most embarrassing situation, I would say, both for the people who are doing the appointing, because where is the legitimacy? We need to have a mandate from the Mahala. We need to have a genuine grassroots supported representation. Because you know what the fault of all this that we've got at the moment is? The fault of it is, the, the great loss is that people will fall back into even further apathy and say, okay, let those guys up in Brussels do it. We've got no say there anyway, so let them do it. So people go on in a very poor situation they don't see much of these high representatives come down and the gap goes on. I hope it can be filled. Really hope. If it is, there is somewhere in this way, there is something that comes out of this present Jubilee Congress, I shall die happy. I really will. I shall lay down and die. I'll be happy. I really will be happy if it can happen. I, 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 I have so much hope that this is an opportunity to hand on to the young, younger generation. And I think there are a lot of people out there who want to be active and may see this as an opportunity to start getting serious about it. I wish you a lot of years of health and uh, to have this opportunity further deliver your valuable knowledge for us as Roma youth. And yeah, we really still need you. Please stay healthy. Yeah, and also uh, while we will uh, go to Thomas Acton for his response, I would like to remind our audience that soon we will start with your questions. Please don't hesitate to write in our chat box the questions what's bothering you and you would like to get the feedback from our honored speakers. And Thomas Acton, if you have a few words uh, regarding the First Roma Congress, how it went uh, on your opinion, whether you achieved uh, what you expected and what's your future vision, what you would like to see, what kind of changes? Um, sorry, you're talking about the First Congress. Um, first Congress. I don't know what I expected from it. I certainly didn't expect everything it achieved. Um, the last 50 years, has been a series of constant surprises of how many things have happened. Um, there are perhaps more dangers now for Roma in the world than there ever have been. But at the same time, the Roma people have more strengths than they ever had. I would, however, maybe just like to question one thing, which everybody keeps talking about the need for unity. I'm a little bit skeptical about that. And I'm going to quote to tell you a story from the Fourth World Romani Congress when the president at the time, Saeed Balish, told off the Romanian delegation for not making up its mind quickly enough. Um, that Fourth World Romani Congress was the first one in which large delegations could come from all the former communist countries. 
and we had oh, some 30 or 40 delegates coming um, from Romania. And every time there was a vote, uh, each country was given just one vote in the Congress, which was one of the bad legacies of communist mm. democratic centrism. But the 30 or 40 Romanian delegates would immediately, there was a vote, they would burst into very vocal arguments about which way their delegation should vote. And eventually Said Balic, the president of the Congress, lost his temper with them. And he said, we cannot go on like this, brothers. Uh, you have to appoint one delegate and that delegate has to cast one vote for the whole delegation. Uh, <laughs> and they immediately started shouting back at him. So he said, I'm going to declare a coffee break for half an hour. You go into that room there and you make up your minds how you're going to do it. And we'll reconvene the plenary session in half an hour. So all the Romani de uh, Romanian delegates went off into that room for half an hour. And we could hear loud discussions coming from that room the whole half hour. And eventually it went silent. And they filed back in and they had appointed the oldest member of the delegation, a Pentecostal Rom pastor, aged about 93 or 91. I don't think anybody really knew uh, what his actual age was. But he stood up there and he said in a firm voice in Romany, he, he said, for 30 years in our country of Romania, they told us that we all had to speak with one voice. Then we had our revolution and nobody is ever going to tell us to speak with one voice again. And the whole, I mean, that was the perfect answer. Uh, nobody did it. They allowed more debates. And I agree, the differences within the Romani political movement are legitimate. There are different interests and there has to be tolerance uh, and as Grattan rightly said, there has to be de democratic legitimacy. So the democratic transition movement, which Grattan has really been the spearhead of for the past 10 years or so, develops from the ideas of Peter Antic in registering Roma for voting electronically in the countries of the former Yugoslavia. And the technology is there. It is possible today. Um, I was amazed just in Britain, uh, one of the traveler organizations, the um, Friends, Families and Travelers started carrying out a voter registration cam campaign amongst Roma, Gypsies and Travelers. And I thought, yeah, what a good idea. Um, but then they came to me and said, you've got to help. So I took their worker round all the caravan dwelling uh, Romani and Irish traveller people just in the place where I live, Brentwood. And I was amazed. We actually, using his or their own mobile phones, registered four or five families to vote out of about 30 people we went to right there and then in one afternoon they all said they were going to vote the operation rom vote in england um registered a lot of people it is possible um so I'm, the so question of... I'm so sorry mr acton just please may you conclude and we already have questions from our audience oh, unfortunately okay. the time is limited so, so I, the, what i'm hoping from the stretch congress is that the democratic transition movement will succeed in selling the possibility of legitimate mass electronic voting and electoral mandates uh, in the Romani people, the Roma people. And um, that's it. Yeah, we hope this system. <laughs> Works. Just to say that the democratic transition is about a voting system within ourselves, our own movement having its own elections, but also 
insisting and urging people to vote in their local election, in their state elections for, for the MPs, for the MEPs, for the local councillors, just as important. But we do know that the only way to have our own legitimate representation is to have our own voting system. That's, that's yeah. the answer. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a great possibility for everyone to be included. Yeah. And also we have a first question from our audience. I will read it. Uh, how was the conference changed into the first Roma Congress? Who were the main figures who managed it? So we know at first it was conference, but how it was transformed into a Congress? Mm -hmm. I couldn't possibly remember <laughs> really what happens. Maybe, maybe, maybe Thomas it's better, but it is true that uh, we got together as a preparatory conference and turned ourselves by uh, adopting a vote that it should be the First World Romany Congress. I can only remember, it, remember very much in the, in the outline of it. Um, it had to happen that way. I think that people had come so far and we, we sensed that, that they had to go ahead to, in that way. I, I can't really give any more greater detail on that. I'm sorry to disappoint the questioner, but it was absolutely um, great enthusiasm and unanimous vote that here we sit around that table in that library, in that kind of house. This has to be the First World Romney Congress. And so, so it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we have the next question. Uh, what is your main message to the youth now? What is your advice? How can we continue the legacy of the First World Roma Congress? Do you have expectation from the youth? I do indeed. I do indeed. I, I suppose all of us, um, when we reach our 80s, have great expectations of the younger generation. I hope we do, because, you know, you are the future. You are the people who will make the world, and you're, you're up, to, up to a lot of Unmade problems not made by Roma, climate change, the, the, the terrible COVID problems of today. But what we can do for ourselves, and I pretty well said this already, is we can act together. As Thomas says, we don't have to all agree. We cannot all agree. But when there's an issue, like, for instance, the destruction of the Holocaust, the Holocaust uh, the Holocaust Memorial in, in Berlin, which is threatened now by German railways digging a hole right through it and, and making an ugly mess of the whole place. When we have issues like that, then surely we can act together and technology gives us that, that ability to reach out around. And although we called ourselves the World Romney Congress, we were not very much global. I think there was a couple of people from the United States, but today we really are global. This is a Jubilee World Roman Congress because we are truly linked up around the world this time. So much can come out of it. I hope much does, but much, 95% is to the younger generation to take it on. If you have something to add about... Yeah. yeah um, Please. Young people have many different vocations, what they want to do. And as a Christian, I tend to believe we should do what we feel God is calling us to do. And so my advice tends to be for those who move towards the academic sphere. Um, I certainly have been privileged to supervise one or two uh, Roma doing PhDs. I would like to see a lot more young Romani people see their possibility of reaching the top of academia and to do that they have to study and they particularly have to study the writings of their enemies uh, they have to learn how ideas work and they have to be confident that they can be as good as anybody and um, so yeah, yeah. I, I can don't say this for, for all Roma youth, but for those who want to study, you can study. And if you do study, if you do go to university, don't think that university is your whole life. You can do other things as well. Um, you can combine it 
with other forms of work. You can combine it with art. You can combine it with business. You can be in academia. You can go and run a business or have a professional practice for art. Come back to academia. That fluidity where people can go in and forward. And young Roma of today have to think that there's nothing they can't do. So it's not not telling them what to do, just to be sure that there's nothing that they can't do. Thank you, thank you. This is a really great words what inspire us to, to do something. And a last but not least question. When will be the next International Roma Congress? If you can just shortly answer on this question. Sorry, did you say when will the next one be? Yes. Well, there's some feeling this this Congress may never stop. I think once we start it, it's not going to get stopped. But there may be there might be a gap of a year or two here and there. But I think now we're going to be things are going to be speeded up and much more radical, more radical, more often, and more of us involved in it. Yes. And I, for now, I would like to thank uh, our great uh, guests and honored speakers for this fruitful and historical discussion. And I would like uh, to close our conversation today with the words of Ian Hancock, who said, we have to put differences aside and combine forces and efforts for what will improve our people as a whole. Uh, meaning the whole Roma nation to unite and fight for the common goods. Thank you very much, Mr. Parkson and Mr. Acton, to be with us today and thank to all our audience for participation and asking questions. And also, just to remind you, uh, I would like to invite you uh, at the live opening of the event of uh, Roma World Congress 50th anniversary exhibition at the ARIAC Facebook today at 6. Yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, Thank you a lot. Thank you. 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 Thank I would like to thank you again for this, that we managed to answer on all our uh, prepared topics and as well questions from the audience. Thank you a lot. I will remember this uh, talk, I think, forever. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was a kind of a big pleasure and honor for me to be here today with you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, I'm going to tell you. Paracatute.